series called Sermon on the Mount where we're looking at Matthew's chapters 5 through 7. And today we get to Jesus. He's talking about money again. That was just a few weeks ago. We were like, Billy, we had a money talk a few weeks ago. Well, Jesus talked quite a bit about money. In fact, he talked about money more than any other subject. And Langdon's giving me an amen already. Langdon's like, yeah, you better, better talk about money. Uh, and, and I just started thinking about our culture and, and what the love of money will do for some people, right? Because money's important for us to have. I mean, money is a kind of a neutral thing. It's, it, it can it feed us. It can provide for our needs. Um, we can be greedy, and it can kind of begin to capture our hearts. And so money can draw us away from things that are really important. But I was thinking about the crazy stuff that happens when people love money. They literally make money their God. I started thinking about years ago when, I uh, remember Black Friday and there was the, the, Walmart, the Walmart worker that got trampled because somebody was trying to get a TV. Like th- this is just crazy stuff that's happening. Just in San Francisco, you guys are seeing on the news, they're called smash and grabs where people literally smash windows and they just grab stuff out and they just rob you right there in the street. I was, I was watching one of those videos, and, it, and, and the people were in traffic. A car pulls up to a car in traffic that was stopped. The people were still in the car. They smashed and grabbed, and they, and they went. And so my, my daughter and I were going to San Francisco last month. To a, she got me tickets to a concert. And um, so we went together, and we were all kind of nervous about the smash and grab. But then I was like, I'm not really nervous because I drive a 2000 Toyota Tundra that's all oxidized and it's, you know, pretty junky looking on the outside. And so I was like, listen, they don't have to smash and grab. I'll leave the doors unlocked and they can just have whatever they want. But just the fact that what what people will do, right? Uh, When I was a kid, people were, were killing other kids over a pair of sneakers. Remember when Jordans back in the late 80s, people were like getting killed because it's like, hey, we, I want your Jordans. And just crazy stuff like that. Um, and so money can ha- have a way of capturing people's hearts. But I don't think most of us are in that place. I think most of us are in this, just this place of wanting more. You know, we live in a culture that's constantly giving us messages that you don't have enough. You need this vacation to be happy. You need to buy this hamburger to be happy. You need to have this in your life in order for you to be content. And, and God said, no, no, no. You, you have all your, your perspective and your priorities completely wrong. You see, what Jesus is going to do in the passage today is he's going to help us to have a right view of how we look at money and resources And so I'm going to go ahead and jump right into Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 uh, through 24. It says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy. Maybe your Bible translation says where moths and rust destroy. The word there in Greek is literally to eat away. So it can be translated a couple different ways. And where thieves break in and steal. Um, but yeah, isn't that kind of what's happening today? But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one, listen to this, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so Jesus makes it very clear, like you can't serve, like you can try to, but the reality is, is you can't, that that you've got to choose one or the other. And for some of you, like you're going, in my heart, I I, kind of express, hey, I, I, I love God, I know God, but in your heart, you're always worried about money, you're always thinking about money, it's something that consumes you, and so God wants to change your heart today. See, and the reality is I'm going to be talking about 
at the end of this message, I want you to know, God doesn't want your, just your money. He wants your heart. That's what he's really going after. Not just your behavior and what you do, but he wants your whole devotion. And so what I want to do is I want to give you a right view of resources today. And I want to give you two things that Jesus says from these verses. And I'll, I'll carry on with some other verses later on in the message. But the first thing is, if you're taking notes, is if you want to have a right view of resources, number one, you have to decide to invest your resources in eternity. Decide to invest your resources in eternity. Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin, uh, vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so basically he's saying, listen, you can't, don't store for, like focus on things that are, here on this earth, they're just going to go away. They're going to get broken. You know, as a kid, I remember just Christmas was such a great time. And, and we believed in, well, I better be careful here if there's any little kids here. We believed in Santa Claus. I guess I still do a little bit. Um, and I remember every single Christmas I would get something. And it was just like that perfect gift. And I was like waiting for it. I'd ask for it. And for some reason, it was like two weeks later, that gift was always broken. It just was kind of the, the reality of situation. I remember when Elissa and I, um, about five or six years ago, we, we financed um, the first car that we ever bought together as a, a married couple. And it was a, a new use from CarMax. So it was, we got a pretty good deal on it, but we still had to finance the car. It was the first time that we hadn't actually saved up money and paid cash for a car because that's what we've always done. And so I remember like just, we were so excited and I'm like, I'm gonna take such good care of this thing. And literally, I have it for three days. I'm driving the car. I look on the side of the road and there's this, this, this bench press, this weight bench, and it's free. And I'm like, oh my, I'm, I'm think it was free. It was somebody, somebody, actually in somebody's garage. But, um, and, I, and so I pick up this, this free weight bench, and I'm like, oh my goodness. And I open up the, the back of the car, and I put it in. As I go to put it in, I, I scratch the bumper from top to bottom, this huge scratch in this new car. And I'm like, why? You know, and I'm just thinking, all of this stuff is just going to get scratched. All of this stuff that you, you own is going to get uh, destroyed at some point. <laughs> if you're from Sonoma County, you know somebody whose house got burned down and you're like, oh my goodness. And it was a big lesson for Elissa and I. And we realized something when we lost everything in that fire was that was the things that we lost it weren't really that important to us. In fact, it was just like all the stuff. You know what was important to us? The things that, that were attached to relationships the videos of our kids, the pictures, the things that we, we attach to relationships. Why? Because the stuff that, that we lost, the physical material stuff, we realized that we can live without that. That's not even that important. You can, we can lose it all. No big deal. What's important? Relationships. What's important? Eternity. These are the things that are important. These are the things that God and for some of you, like maybe you didn't lose all your stuff in a fire, but maybe you lost all your money in the stock market. You know, maybe something happened. Maybe you were, you were robbed. But there was something in your life where you put a lot of value in your stuff and that, that stuff was gone and you realized, okay, what's most important? Because what I've realized in my life is the most important things in life are not things. They're people. They're our relationship with God. And, and, and so God wants us, to rela wants us to invest in relationships, just like Jolene. What is she doing? Because of God and because she wants to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ, she is investing in relationships because that's what's most important. And so, um, you know, as we, we think about this and I, I think about money and being generous, and uh, you know, we talk a lot about tithing here at the church. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we think it's important that you are, are tithing and you're, you're giving. And sometimes people will say, "Well, I give of my time, I give of my talents," and I would say that is amazing. We have some of the best volunteers here at the bridge, and I'm so grateful for that. But that doesn't discount the fact that God wants you to also give your resources to his work and to what he's doing. And so 
when I say that, for some of you, you oh, you mean God wants me to give my money? You, you have to understand. We think that it's we're giving our money to God. That's a complete misconception. The reality is, is that God owns it all anyways. We're just giving him back a little bit of what he's already given to us. And so uh, we just have to, we have to realize that if, if money uh, begins to capture our hearts, that we then are serving the master of money, like Jesus said, and we can't serve two masters. Uh, a quote, there's a quote here, it says, if you own something you cannot give away, then you don't own it, it owns you. Just let that sink in for a second. And Frank says, no one has ever become poor by giving. And Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. And so when you give to the work that God is doing here at this local church, you know what you're doing? You're giving and investing into eternity. I just got to share with you some of the things that are happening in our church that are pretty powerful. This week at our youth group on Tuesday night, uh, we had one of our, our uh, the students that comes to our school here and he comes to the church or he comes to the youth group. Um, he gave a message on prayer. He's 18 years old. He's a senior in high school and he is absolutely on fire for the Lord. His grandparents come here and they pray for him all the time and they're all excited to see their grandson on fire for the Lord. And here's the cool thing. As they were... Uh, you know, as they were listening, and I got to give some props to my son who invited basically the entire GCA. And so our youth group, we had 35 students. We only, usually only 15, 20. We had like 35 students there that night. And it was powerful. Why? Because they were going to hear one of their own peers give the message. And, and as, as he gave the message, do you, I've never seen the students on the edge of their seats you know, when someone else is speaking or an adult is speaking to the youth, they're, they're always like, okay, what do you got for me, right? They're listening to their own. I'm thinking, that's investment. That's like you're investing in what God is doing through our youth group and what God is doing through our children's ministry. And when you invest here at the bridge, you're investing in the local and global outreach um, investments and ministries that we're partnering with here at the bridge. And you're investing in life change. That's what ultimately it's all about. It's about life change and it's about eternity. And so I don't ever want you to think that, hey, when I'm investing here at the bridge, I'm just investing into a PG&E bill. That's not what it's all about. It's all about the fact that we've got the doors open. We've got the seats. Oh, we will put out as many seats as we need for people to come to hear the good news, the life-changing message that God loves them more than they could ever imagine, that he sent his son Jesus, and that we can have a relationship with him. That's the life-changing message. And so invest in eternity, you guys. Invest in eternity. Jesus continues on in verse 22. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, uh, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So he says, if the light in you is, is healthy, and he uses the words healthy and unhealthy, really what the Greek implied there is if your eyes are either generous Everything else in your life is going to be full of light and generosity. If your eyes are stingy, everything else in your life. And so basically Jesus is saying, if you have a wrong view of money, you're going to get everything else wrong in your life. But if you have a right view of money and you have a, a money like where God is first and you set him on the throne of your life and then you allow God to work through that and you're, you're investing in what God is doing, then you're gonna see money work and, a ble and, and see blessing and lives blessed and you will be blessed. And so um, uh, I love what he says here, verse 24, no one can serve, if you're in your Bibles, no one can serve two masters, either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And I love how Jesus makes that distinction between God and money. Because he says, 
listen, you can't, it's kind of not like this like fence type thing where you can just be on the fence about it. And like, you know, I kind of love God a little bit. I really like money. And someday, you know, like, no, no, no. It's either you love the other or, and you hate the, the other. It's like there's, there's this line that he draws. And so you can't love both God and money. And so invest in eternity. The second thing that Jesus says is he says this about having a right view of resources. He says, don't worry about resources. Don't worry about resources. Don't think about it. And, and obviously, we have to have jobs and we have to work and, and we can be concerned about our resources. And sometimes you look at your budget and you look at where you're at financially and there's some concern there. But he doesn't want you to worry, to have anxiety, to lose sleep over your resources. And he's going to go on to tell you why that's the case. Verse 25 in Matthew chapter 6. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. And what Jesus is doing there is he's asking a rhetorical question. The obvious answer is, of course, life is more than these things. And so he's, he's asking these rhetorical questions as he's getting this point across to these people that are listening to him. And then he goes on in verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Let's stop there for a second. Are you not much more? If he's going is he, he's gonna to feed the birds of the air, he looks at you and goes, I'm going to take care of them. How much more am I going to take care of you? You're much more valuable than birds. And so I'm going to make sure, and you just have to understand something when we're talking about resources and finance, like we find a lot of our security in money. And when we go after, we think that's what's going to provide security. You know what I find security in? I find security in the fact that God loves me, that he cares about me, that he knows my, what my situation is, and that he's going to take care of me. That's my security. That, that's your security. And so uh, he goes on to say um, in verse, and the, and yet your father feeds them. Verse 20, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? So he's asking another rhetorical question. The answer is no. Worrying about resources does not add any value to your life whatsoever. But here's the, the other flip side of it, is that Jesus is giving an illustration, which he always gave illustrations, and he always painted pictures for people to understand, right? He's talking about the birds of the air. Well, on Monday, I went out to the, the ocean, and I've just been going out and soaking in the ocean. It's kind of like a cold plunge, and it just feels so good. If you ever get in cold water, there's nothing better. Than it. And so I'm out in the ocean. I'm at Dorn Beach. I've got a flotation device because my wife always tells me, like, Elis always goes, hey, if you're going out to the beach, could you make sure you come back alive? I'm like, oh, I'll, that's a good, a good deal. I'll do that. And so I'm out there, and I see there's birds out there, and I see these two pelicans I'm pretty sure they're pelicans. They're the ones with the long snor uh, snorts, uh, snouts, beaks, and they've got, the, they've got the thing. Well, anyway, so here's what, what pelicans do. They go in, and they kind of corral the fish, and then they come in, and they basically, they take a big gulp of water, up to three gallons they can hold in their throat there, and, and then they, they eat. And so the point is this, is that even though we don't have to worry about money, God has still called us to do what we can do. He still called us to work. And so when I'm looking at the birds, they're over there, and I could hear their conversation. They weren't talking like, hey, Vern, I'm really scared about where I'm going to get my next meal. They weren't saying that. They're like, hey, let's go over here and make sure we get our food. 
I, that's what they said. That's why I, I, I was that close. <laughs> and so, so God has called us to work. He's called us to earn a living. That's important. But he hasn't called us to worry about it because he's going to take care of us. He continues on in verse 28. He says, and uh, bless you, by the way, yeah. Uh, Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. Uh, Who is Solomon? Solomon is the, the wisest and the richest king that ever lived. And so Solomon, he built the temple for God. He wore really nice clothes. I mean, the guy, he was dressed better than you could ever imagine being. He's, he was better dressed than Langdon here. I mean, I'm just, it was, he was good. And he dresses, and, and the Bible says that, look at the, the lilies, the flowers, he dresses them, and they're, they're better dressed than Solomon. How much more is he going to take care of you? If that is how God clothes the, grass, uh, clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? You know, uh, I, I love to, to share this story. So when... When we ran out of the house, basically we ran out of the house and that was what we, we had. That's what we owned um, and back in 2017. And so I ran out of the house. I had slippers, this old white t-shirt and a pair of shorts. And I was like, okay, that's what I own. Um, and so I remember there was somebody that had evacuated during that time that came to the church and they thought they were gonna lose their home, but their, their home was spared, but they had brought a bag full of clothes. And so I remember this guy giving me this bag full of clothes and it had some cash in it. It was such a blessing to me. And I was thinking like, thank you, God. Thank you that you have provided. But the interesting part of the story is two, two months after the fires, I had to make a goodwill run and I had to donate bags of clothes because, first of all, some people just donated some funky stuff to me. I'm like, I'm never going to wear this. Um, but the other part of it was that we, I had more clothes than I could ever imagine within two months of having everything totally gone. And, and it just showed me, God will take care of you. If you lost everything, I guarantee you God would take care of you. I guarantee you because I know he's done it for me. And so... Um, I just love this fact that, that God clothes. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some, some little tips here in terms of how do you, you, know, how do you dress nicely? And, and I know here Langdon here, is, uh, he's dressed nicely. He's, he's a good steward of the finances that God has given him. Um, I'll tell you right now, like for me right now, uh, everything that I am wearing today is from a thrift store. Like everything that I'm wearing today, I bought at a thrift store. So every, like my wardrobe is under $30. I'm talking everything I'm wearing except for my socks. I, I didn't buy those at a thrift store. Some of you are like doing some deductive reasoning right now. You're like, everything? <laughs> and so my, my point is this too. Like we don't have to worry about money, but I think it's important for us to be financial stewards that we, we want to, every dollar counts. And every dollar that God provides for us can be invested for eternity. And so how does that play out in my life? Well, for you, maybe it's just making sure, it's like I'm gonna try to figure out how, I, how can I lower my food budget? Uh, how can I lower my clothing budget? How can I be wise with the resources? Some of the, one of the things that we do around here is that uh, before the pandemic, we used to go to Starbucks and we would buy this big jug of, of Starbucks coffee and it was $70 every single week. And it was a lot of money. It just kind of added up, added up. And so Darby came to me one time. She goes, I can go to Costco, buy Starbucks coffee and I can make a bunch of coffee here for a fraction of the price. And so we went from, as a church, spending $70 on coffee every week to guess what? Spending $7 on coffee every week. And, and, and so, so I just want you guys to know, I would never ask you guys to do something that even personally I'm doing or as a church that we're doing. 
that we want, to be, we want to be good financial stewards of the resources God has given us. But then God says this, Jesus says this in this passage, verse 33, and I love this, and this is the main point here, so don't miss this. Jesus says, um, or, or, or let me jump back up to verse 31 real quick. Uh, we, I don't want to skip that. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Verse 32, for the pagans run after all of these things and your heavenly father knows what you need. And it's just so interesting to me, you guys, that during the pandemic, that why did we hoard toilet paper? I still, to this day, do not know. Okay. I do not know why everybody was um, so, <laughs> my wife and I, we bought a bidet in case that ever happens again. Um, <laughs> but I'm just going, like, do you remember? It was, there was such a panic around resources. And I think there still is a little bit of this panic of, like, what if the shelves go empty? Guys, we don't have to worry about this. We don't have to be so caught up and consumed with all of this because God's going to take care of us. And so he's going to help us. Um, and, and this is why, this is, this is the culmination of what Jesus is getting to. Verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And so I love this. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. Put God first. Elevate him above everything else in your life. And guess what's going to happen? Everything else will fall into order because you have your priorities right. And so it's, it's a by faith thing. I'm just going to trust God, seek him first in my finances. I'm going to seek him first in my relationships. I'm going to seek him first in my personal life, in my in my recreation life, I'm going to seek him first in everything. And guess what happens? Every one of those areas of your life gets better because God's in charge now. And so seek first God. You know, I wanted to, um, I wanted to be kind of transparent with you guys. And, and it's funny that I'm, I'm preaching this sermon about not worrying about money. And I, I just had a conversation with our treasurer this week that was saying that uh, we are, you know, we're really operating at definitely a, a deficit as a church. And so we're trying to figure out, okay, where can we cut cost and, and what, we can, can, what can we do to change this? And, you know, and for me, I, I don't want to go into a, like a manipulative, like you have to give money and go into this panic as a leader. I don't want to do that. But I, I started thinking about something and I was thinking about, okay, so how many people call the bridge their home church? I'm just going to say 200 people. That's probably a low number in terms of like not everybody comes on a Sunday morning. But probably 200 people come and they call the bridge their home church. Um, and then I, I just, for sake of numbers, I decided to say, well, what if everybody, the 200 people, they each gave $200 a month? which would say that all of you that are giving $200 a month are making $24,000 a year, which would be really well below the poverty line. Some of you are making below $2,400. Most of you probably, as a family, making more than $2,400. And so, I, so if everybody in our church gave $200, um, that would help us meet our budget. And that's assuming that everybody is living below the poverty line which tells me this, is that we actually have kind of a smaller portion of our church that is incredibly generous and is carrying the weight of the rest of the church. And so as I was thinking about this illustration, I was thinking about where we're at as a church, I got excited about it. Not because I, I want this to be a big shame thing, because I started getting excited about the fact that there's a lot of potential and there's people that God's going to touch this morning and they're going to realize, hey, this is what God is calling me to do, to resource and to invest in, in eternity. 
And you're going to make that decision. You're going to step across that line and say, money doesn't have a hold on my heart anymore. I'm going to start tithing. I'm going to start giving to what God is doing here at the bridge. And so that's my encouragement to you is just listen. Um, some of you are, are carrying the weight and, and you guys are generous and it's a blessing. You know who you are and I'm thankful for what God is doing through you. But I would also challenge some of you that aren't giving. You know what? This is the day that you take that step of faith. And, and, and don't misunderstand me, guys. God doesn't need your money. God wants your heart. He wants your life. He gave everything for you. You can never outgive God. God gave his one and only son, Jesus, to die on a cross. The least that we can do now is give him our lives. And that's what he's calling us to do. And so I want to encourage you guys. Um, I want to encourage you guys with that. And so here's the, I, get, I just gave you kind of the, the reality um, of, of our situation. So that was the bad news. Um, I'm going to give you some, I'm going to give you some good news. The good news is this. As a church, we have all the money and the resources that we need to accomplish the vision and the mission that God has given us here at the bridge. But the bad news is that it's in your bank account still. And so, um, <laughs> Listen, guys, I'm not worried. I'm not worried about what God's going to Listen, God is here. He's working. I see him working in our church. I see uh, just the, the beauty of diversity that is, is represented here. I see the, uh, the, the, the multiple generations that are represented here. And I'm seeing what God is doing, so I'm not nervous about it. But as your pastor, I have to communicate the truth. And hopefully something today that you can just take one thing that God spoke to you today about and say, I'm going to take that step. I'm going to apply that to my life. And I'm going to become a little bit more like Jesus this week. And I'm going to pray that God would give you the strength to do that. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you sent your one and only son, Jesus. That, Lord, you gave everything for us. And so, Lord, we, we thank you for that. And I pray for anyone in here that's never said yes to Jesus, that right now in their hearts they say, Jesus, I put you first. God, I want to put you at the throne of my life. I want you to be number one. I'm going to seek you first. And, Lord, just all the things that, Jesus, you said to us in your word that we can't serve both God and money. And so, Lord, right now, we cast down the idol of money in our hearts and our lives, and we elevate you to your rightful place, God, God, that we worship you. Father, I, I want to be sensitive to those that are struggling financially right now, to those that are, are hurting. Maybe they've lost a job. Maybe the, uh, even just haven't recovered fully from the, the effects of the pandemic. Father, whatever it is, Lord, right now, just that they would know that you care for them. That, Lord, if you're able to feed the birds of the air and if you're able, able to clothe the, the flowers of the field, God, that you're going to take care of their physical needs and, their, and their, uh, the food and the things that they need to survive. God, we thank you for your love and your concern for us, Lord. Help us to trust you and put our faith in you alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.